One of the most important aspects about quantum mechanics is that when we perform experiments that involve quantum systems, the outcomes observed can have an intrinsic level of randomness associated with them. This is very much in contrast with classical physics, where if we have a good model of our system and full knowledge of its initial conditions, we can perfectly predict, at least in principle, how that system will behave over time. Therefore, in order to understand how quantum computing works, we need to introduce a very few basic concepts related to probability theory and discuss how to deal with situations where there is some level of uncertainty in the results we can potentially observe when performing measurements. So the idea for this video is to discuss a way to describe classical probabilistic systems using a very similar framework to the one we will later use to describe quantum systems. So let's start by defining the concept of a probabilistic bit or a p-bit. And to do that, let's take something we defined in a previous video, which was the X gate. Now, if you recall, the X gate is the equivalent of a NOT gate, which if we have a zero at the input, we get a one at the output. And if we have a one at the input, we get a zero at the output. But now let's assume that the physical implementation of this X gate has some problems. And for some reason, we don't always get a one at the output, but rather sometimes we get a zero and sometimes we get a one. And let's say that the zero we observe with probability of one quarter and then the one we measure with probability of three quarters. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, if we were to, let's say, turn on our system that contains this X gate and put a zero at this input and then measure its output, well, sometimes we will see a one. And if we were to repeat this experiment, maybe we'll see a one again, repeat it again, maybe we see that one again. But then in the fourth time we do this, we measure a zero. And if we continue with this process, then what we will see is that if we were to count the number of times we measure a zero, let's call that n zero, and divide it by the total number of times we perform this experiment, let's call that n, when we take the limit of that n going to infinity, which means we just repeat this experiment many, 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 many times, that ratio is going to be equal to that probability of one quarter. Similarly, if we now take the ratio of the number of times we measure a one and divide it by the total number of times we perform the experiment, then that's gonna give us three quarters. So this is what we mean by probability, is the ratio of times we are expected to measure a given outcome with respect to the total number of times we repeat the experiment. Now, there are many different ways in which we can model such type of behavior but a very convenient one is to do something similar to what we did in the previous video and is to adopt this column vector notation. So first off, since this gate isn't really giving us the behavior of an X gate, let's maybe relabel it and call it a P gate for probabilistic gate. And then recall that if we want to represent a zero in column vector notation, what we're going to do is use a two entry vector with a one at the top and a zero at the bottom. And now to represent this probabilistic behavior, what we can do is take the first entry of our column vector to represent the probability of measuring a zero and the second entry to represent the probability of measuring a one. Now notice that this is consistent with the deterministic input of zero we have here, because what this vector represents is that we have a probability of one of measuring a zero and probability of zero of measuring a one. And then we call this type of element a p-bit or a probabilistic bit. So let's go back and take a look at the definition we gave to the column vector representation for a bit. So we said that a bit B was given by a column vector with components beta zero and beta one, where this beta sub i elements could only take values of zero and one. And now what we have for a p-bit is we have a vector p with components 
row zero and row one, where this raw sub i's are now positive real numbers. Now, for the case of our column vector representation for the bit, we said that we also had to meet the restriction that the length of that vector, which is given by the square root of beta zero squared plus beta one squared, had to be equal to one. Now, in the case of a probability bit, well, what we want is for the components row zero and row one to respect the rules of probabilities, which means that row zero plus row one must be equal to one because probabilities must always add up to one. Now, just a couple of uh, notational clarifications here. When I say that this row sub i's belong to the positive reals, I also mean that that includes a zero. I mean, we could have just say that this row sub i's belong to any number in the interval zero to one, both zero and one included. But at the end of the day, that just means the same thing because we we've added this restriction of probabilities having to add to one. And then also notice here how I have opted to represent this probability vectors using the, the conventional arrow notation for a vector rather than ket notation. And that's just personal preference because I like to reserve ket notation for vectors that are actually contained in the family of vectors that represent qubits or quantum bits. And probability vectors really don't belong to that vector space. Now that's it for single probability bits or p-bits. But uh, what if we have a system where we have uh, two or more of these uh, elements? So let's say we have a, a circuit where we have one of these uh, P gates that we just described up before. And then maybe we have another uh, P bit where we're just applying a, a deterministic X gate that behaves the way we expect. So we know that here at the top, we have our probability vector with let's say that it had the same probabilities of occurrence of one quarter for zero and three quarters to measure one. And then the, the bottom P bit, well, we just represent deterministically. And, you know, we're assuming that here we initialize everything at zero. Then uh, for the bottom uh, P bit, uh, now we have a one here, which in vector form is uh, zero one. So if we want to represent the vector for this overall system, we do the same thing we describe for um, the column vector representation of bits. We just take the Kronecker product between those two vectors. So we just follow the same rules where let's actually label this top one P1, this bottom one P0. So we take P1, which is one quarter and three quarters, and we tensor it with zero and one. So then we're gonna get a column vector with four elements where first we multiply one quarter with zero one, and then we multiply three quarters with again, that same vector zero one. So the overall vector we get is zero, one quarter, zero, three quarters. And what this vector represents, so let's, let's move it down here. This first entry represents the probability of measuring at the output of this overall system, a zero for the top P bit and a zero for the bottom P bit. Then the next ent entry of one quarter represents the probability of measuring a zero for the top P bit and a one for the bottom P bit and so on for the remaining entries. So each of these vector entries represent the probabilities of measuring the combination of this outputs for the two p bits. So in general, the vector for a p bit system with n p bits can be represented by taking the Kronecker product of all the different p bits in the system. So let's take a quick look at an example using Python. So like before, we're gonna import NumPy and SymPy. Let's go ahead and define a vector. Let's call it p1 which is gonna be a NumPy array with entries of one quarter, which is the probability of measuring a zero, and three quarters, which is gonna be the probability of measuring a one. And let's go ahead and display our vector. 
And if we want to simulate a system that has this type of probabilities, what we can do in Python is use NumPy's random library, which has a function called choice, where we can pass the, the values that we want as outcomes. So as we know, this is the probability of measuring a zero, this is the probability of measuring a one, so our possible outcomes are zero and one. Then we can pass the number of samples we want, so let's say 100, and then we pass the probabilities of occurrence of each of these two possible outcomes. So that's gonna be our vector P1. Now, this function is expecting this to be a row vector, but here we define it as a column vector, so we just need to use this reshape function. What if we pass a minus one to it? It just flattens any vector, so it, it turns a column vector into a flat row vector. So let's save this in a variable called samples. And if we print this, we can see that we get some zeros and some ones. And if we, we count these, we're gonna see that we get roughly a quarter of the time a zero and roughly three quarters of the time a one. So let's actually count that using this numpy function count non-zero, where we can pass a condition that we want this uh, list to meet. So I'm gonna ask how many times in this samples list I have a zero. And here we can see we get about 19. And then for one, we got about 81. And if we were to divide this by the number of samples we took, we should get the frequency of the number of zeros and the number of ones we have, which as we said, if we increase this number and make it approach infinity, it should give us the exact probabilities of each one of these. So let's actually define a variable, let's call it n samples, which is 100, and store the number of ones in a variable called ones, and the same for zeros. And let's go ahead and print those two. Here we can see we get about 19% of the time zeros and 81% of the time. This number should be 25 and 75. So let's now increase this to 1000. Let's just not display that. And here we can see that this is getting closer to 25% and this to 75%. Let's do 10,000. Here we can see those numbers get closer and closer to the exact probabilities. And now let's say we have a second P bit, let's call it P2, and define an array again, uh, where let's say that we have a probability of one half of measuring zero and a probability of one half of measuring one. And let's say we want to compose that system into a P bit array that has both P1 and P2. So we do the Kronecker product between P2 and P1, and we can display our new vector, which now gives us the probability of measuring zero in the first P bit and zero in the second P bit, zero in the first P bit and one in the second one, and so on. So let's sample from this vector. Let's just go ahead and copy the code we have here. But now what we're going to do is, instead of only having this two, choices, we're going to have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. But since we need to pass here decimal numbers, well, we can leave 0, 0 as 0, 0, 1 as 1, 1, 0 as 2, and 1, 1 as 3. And now instead of passing this vector P1, we pass our vector P. Let's print those samples, which is going to give us a list of observing each of these four possible outcomes with these four possible probabilities. And again, we can measure that frequency by dividing the number of times we measure a zero by the total number of times we perform the experiment. And that should give us closely a probability of one eighth in this particular case. So if we print that, we don't quite get close to that number, but if we increase the number of samples, let's say 10,000, then we start approaching that 0 0.125. So let's do 100,000. Here we have it, it starts getting closer and closer. We could do the same thing for the number of twos, which should be about the same probability. Uh, also, technically here, we don't have to pass decimal numbers, but since in Python, there's not a type for binary numbers, we'll have to use, for example, strings. So we can pass 0, 0, 0, 1, one zero and one one. And, and that's just gonna give us a list 
with the characters corresponding to the possible outcomes if we prefer doing it this way. And to count the number of occurrences of each of these items, we'll have to then pass to this count non zero function, obviously the corresponding element we want to count. So for counting the number of twos, which is one zero, we'll have to pass here one zero. And that gives us again, the probability we're looking for. So the last thing we need to discuss is how do we represent the gates that generate and transform this probabilistic bits. So for that, let's go back to our example of that P gate we had at the beginning of the video where we had that for an input of zero, which is given by the vector one zero, we were getting a P bit vector with probability of a quarter of measuring zero and probably of three quarters of measuring one. But we never discuss how does this gate transform the input one? Well, for this example, let's assume that the gate behaves as an X gate as expected. So let's say that if we input a one, we do get a zero at the output. So if we have all of the input to output relationships for this gate, then we can do something similar to what we did in the previous video and just define a matrix with some arbitrary entries, let's call them P00, P01, P10, and P11, and then just multiply that by the corresponding inputs and equate them to their corresponding outputs. And performing the matrix multiplication here on the left, it's gonna give us a, the vector P00 and P10, which now we know each of those coefficients then have to equate the values of that other vector. So P00 is a quarter, P10 is three quarters. And we can do the same thing for the second input of one, giving us zero at the output. So the matrix that represents this gate is given by one quarter, three quarters, and then one zero. Now an important distinction between this probabilistic gates and the gates we've been working with so far is that probabilistic gates are not reversible. And intuitively, that should make sense. If we take a, a deterministic bit, let's say zero, and we apply one of these probabilistic gates, what we're doing is we're introducing uncertainty on the value at the output. So it doesn't make sense that there would exist another probabilistic gate that would exactly reverse that process and give us another deterministic bit at the output. Mathematically, we can also see this if we were to try, for example, to apply another gate here right after our P gate, such that we would recover our inputs one zero and zero one. Well, it turns out that that matrix is actually the inverse of P. And if we try to work out the math for that, it turns out that P inverse has values of zero, 4 over 3, 1, and minus 1 over 3. Well, the problem here is that these two entries here are not valid probabilities. Even though these two numbers do add up to 1, minus 1 over 3 doesn't have a valid interpretation in terms of probabilities. Now, what we will see later is that what makes quantum computing different from classical probability is that the gates that we use to transform our qubits are actually reversible, even though quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. And we'll of course cover those details as we progress in this video series. So that's it for this video, which concludes what I wanted to cover in terms of classical systems. So in the next video, we'll start introducing the concept of a qubit, which as you probably know by now, is a fundamental unit of information for quantum computing. Thanks again and hope to see you in the next one.